For a man who had no formal training as a naval architect, Don Shedd has done remarkably well for himself, becoming one of the world's foremost designers of power craft. His lifestyle is not unlike that of the millionaires who buy his boats. He not only understands the jet set, he's become part of it. I'm not terribly interested. Car and get very enthusiastic about slow boats. Um, but lots of other people can. I can't. So that I'm intending to be a complete specialist on high-speed power boats, whether they be racing boats, pleasure boats, or in fact now gun boats. It's the sort of business which I think is, is going to grow. Time for everybody is getting shorter and people are more used to going fast. From his early days as an engineer in Birmingham, Don Shedd now finds himself in demand in America and throughout Europe. Italy, in particular, is almost a second home. Well, the Mediterranean um, the market for large pleasure boats is dominated by Italian builders and Italian designers. There is a, a basically a, quite a big difference, or used to be up until a few years ago, between a northern European motor yacht and a Mediterranean motor yacht. The northern European yacht had always tended to be something which was all enclosed and they got a heater. The Mediterranean motor yacht is very much open air living, has no heater but has full air conditioning. A great difference. A prestige symbol may be, but often very necessary. Within an hour, a glassy Mediterranean can be whipped to a frenzy by a gale. Power ensures the safety of a harbor. The launch of a new powerboat in Italy is a big occasion. The Latin love of speed and style in racing machines is exemplified in twin versions of Shed's latest thinking, brought to fruition in a Via Reggio boatyard. Here, perhaps more than anywhere else, a designer is a celebrity, and the result of his talents, something to be marveled at. How often do you actually come over to this place, Tom? I come over here for pretty well every other week, you know, at least two, sometimes three times a month. Is that because you have to keep an eye on the way the boats are shaping up? Or? Yes, it is. The, um, I've been very keen on, on building boats in Italy because Italy is really the last sort of stronghold of the artisan boat builder. And you can really? come here with a sort of bundle of drawings and sometimes they won't even pay any attention to them. Sometimes they will. But whatever they do, you can generally reckon is made by people who know the sea and make incredible boats and what, the Italians you, are fantastic at it. Why do you think that's more preferable than building the boats in England? In England recently, I mean, it's been very difficult to get custom type boats made. You can go and buy, uh, and we're ex extremely able at it in England, making fiberglass type production boats. But when it comes to one-offs on the sailboat scene, England's produced the most amazing boats, the Admiral's Cup boats and so mm. on. But recently, as far as custom motor yachts and power boats of all sorts, then I'm afraid the Continentals have been taken over from us. Shed's office is in Fareham, despite taxation and time spent overseas. He's freelanced since 1970, having previously made a name for himself with the Avenger. Well, the Avenger was a boat which had basically been all its development and all the time I'd spent on it and everything had all been done on the sea. I think we were probably the first set of people to follow the lead which the Americans had shown in actually making speedboats which went on the sea in varied water conditions, could cope with waves and were actually boats to go offshore in rather than just go up and down a flat piece of water. Shed design came to the forefront in 1968. The competition, though limited, was intense. From America, Don Arano's already successful designs were leading up to his famous cigarette line. And from Italy, there was Sonny Levy, who the previous year had designed the winner of the classic Cow's Torquay race. Shed's offering was a small wooden 26-footer built for Tommy Sopwith. 
It had a deep V-shaped hull with an engine as far aft as possible. It's very difficult to be able to say exactly what the difference is between one's own powerboat designs and say so the designs of the other people running. In that powerboat racing is an incredibly competitive sport, particularly as far as the designers and the constructors are concerned. So that the boats eventually evolve rather than have great innovations and great breakthroughs. They don't happen. And that they although they become during some years all sort of look alike. Under the surface that I'm not. Tommy Sopworth's Tollstar, designed by Shedd, won the 68 Cows Torquay, one of the roughest on record, and extended that year to include the return leg to cows. Shedd never looked back. Next was HTS, again built in wood, and the most successful offshore powerboat ever in terms of prices. Shedd, though, was shifting his views on construction. The majority of the boats which I've been racing and other people have been racing to my design have been made out of aluminium, which is no mere coincidence in that I feel that metal is the material which you can properly design in, properly engineer, and properly stress and understand. G, a quad-engine boat and still the biggest racing, was designed for marathons. But there was room for even more experiments. All it needed was a tobacco company to come up with a backing. We went ahead and made for them what I still think is a classical boat, which is Miss Embassy, which was the marrying of a very well-known Rolls-Royce gas turbine engine. And we put that into a proper race boat hull. And this boat was, we hoped, was going to be very fast and very successful. But the uh, horsepower and the equivalents worked out by the gods who control the sport meant that the equivalent horsepower we were allowed to get out of the turbine was not sufficient to make it go very fast. But other than that, technically it was great fun in that we were able to, to see a turbine in a race boat and running well. As a top driver, Shed is in demand to steer his own design, such as you know what. There are far too many others afloat though for him to drive them all. is one of the fastest boats around and in 1973 with shed driving she won the cows torquay but then as now the world championship eluded him for around 35,000 pounds the latest in shed thinking can be yours again it's the deep v shape as yet there's no sign of a multi-hull a mono hull looks sympathetic with the sea and it's you can make it long thin and looking like something to just go piercing the waves all the way through. As soon as you go to two hulls or three hulls, it, it never quite looks the same, but the sailing boat people have proven that you don't need to have a very good looking boat to go and win, say, the transatlantic race, where, where the multi-hulls have been dominating. While others design catamarans, Shed pursues a proven course. Obviously, the, the great thing which has come out of designing offshore racing powerboats is a sort of recognition that the, that, that the guy who does it is actually going boating, subjecting himself to the most ridiculous stresses and strains, and therefore he might be a reasonable fellow to have a go at designing a pleasure boat. And a few years ago, Halmatic, who had done in Portsmouth, commissioned a pleasure boat of around 34 foot long, to be made out of a fiberglass called DS-110. And this led me to think that obviously some of the things which we're doing, and particularly at that time, we're learning out of the racing boats, were applicable to pleasure boats. In that really a pleasure boat more than a race boat. Once, soft riding, dryness, good handling, ability to be caught out in a 
nasty sea, nasty night out, and get back home jolly quickly. Well, these are exactly what a race boat is all about. Once a prospective owner has got his design, he'll ask Shed where the contract to build should be awarded. The answer invariably is abroad. Via Reggio is really the centre of the yacht building business in Europe. It's managed to build up there an incredible sort of complete town really of artisan workers who switch from yard to yard. And there are in Via Reggio probably 20 or 30 different organizations, each catering with electronics, machinery, air conditioning, steel work, aluminium work, all of whom operate as subcontractors. Um, or any really big shipyard can just pick up the phone and maybe ring two or three subcontractors, get a quote off them for doing a job, and they'll be in there within a couple of days. It's a unique place. I don't know how much longer it can go on. Probably not too much longer, but the day it all stops happening out there will be a great loss to designers such as I am and also Einfield to the owners as well. Shad's luxury cruisers are a development of his racing boats with large planing hulls and in some cases power units providing 30 knots through the water. In the Med, power equals pleasure. We used to call that the Cadillac. Yeah. <laughs> Very gentleman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. 60 miles an hour runabouts designed by Shed are built in via Reggio by Turbo Marine. Anyway, uh, this shape, Shed uh, shape, you know, is better for him because it's uh, less uh, yeah. blown out. Uh, the cigarette. <laughs> <laughs> good, good, good. Okay. You like this? The I think this is very nice, yes. We put the first with the Isotto Fraschini. How much is it? Is the hull and deck. Uh, how many uh, lira or whatever you Depends use? Depends on the engine. Without engines, how much? Ah, without engine. Yeah, just hull and deck. Quanto coperta il controller qua? Andrà sui 40 milioni. With accommodation or without accommodation? Without accommodation. Is uh, about 40 million. Well, I'm only looking for something else. We've got two sitting rotting. I want to get something new. Anyway, oh well. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. We're done. I think so. We just came in here for a walk around. What sort of person would buy these enormous pleasure yachts? Well, either very rich people who've inherited a fortune or successful people that have made one. Um, if they have an international company, they can probably uh, find ways and means of paying for it. Um, and some of the people buy boats and, and charter them, so they actually turn it into a commercial operation. But, uh, you know, I would like to see some boats built back in England, possibly smaller boats. Um, and maybe that day will come. The interesting thing about Don Shedd is that he's one of the few designers, if not the only designer in the world, who actually competes um, in his own designs. Uh, so consequently, he really does know the problems that drivers and competitors are up against. What do you say um, Don Shedd's contribution has been to His power design, boating? the boats he's built are successful. The problem is that there hasn't been enough of them campaigned. But the ones that do run, run very well, and uh, there's no question about it. It just needs more of his shapes on the water. I think that he's a man very good for rough seas, a rough man. But uh, he's also a sweet man when he designs. I appreciate it very much, uh, my friend Shed. I ran many, many races in England, in the States, in Italy, against these boats. I remember Yolo Float, Miss Embassy. They stayed very well in the sea, and uh, I always uh, had in mind to stay in a boat designed by Shed. What sort of contribution do you think he's made to the tremendous development of power boating in the last 10 years? I think that it was a very, very useful contribution because uh, we had uh, at the beginning uh, uh, an impressive presence of American people, of American uh, designers. There were many, and then at present we have only two, Bertram and uh, Cigarettes. But uh, uh, the characteristics of the, the sheds, the boats, are uh, absolutely different. Shed's boat is very sweet on the sea. And uh, when I ran uh, with my boat at Italia 1, 
I am sure, like, uh, like on a good horse, he will not break. Race day in Via Reggio. The Italian's equivalent of the Cal's Torquay is an endurance event to Corsica and back, which forms part of the European Championship. The spectators assess the runners and riders by the form book. Shed weighs up the opposition with a more critical eye. What do you make of some of these other boats here, then, Don? They're always out in Italy, the interesting boats. In, the, in England, the boats have been fairly stereotyped for quite a few years. But out here, they always produce a few original, nice, and always very well finished and nicely made boats. What about something like that catamaran, for instance? Catamarans have got to eventually be the way to go. Um, they, they are showing very high speeds, and in the past they haven't normally been very good in rough water. But that's beginning to change. Well, what sort of speed would that one do? That one, that, that one is, I think, the right saying, is the fastest single-engine boat in the world. It runs somewhere around 80, 82 miles an hour, which is faster than we used to have twin-engine boats running sort of even two, two years ago. Each engine for a powerboat costs upwards of £6,000 and a transmission unit adds another £2,000. They're highly stressed and the slightest fault, likely as not, will blow the whole thing apart. It happens frequently. Scrutineers check that the rules of racing are followed to the letter. They also ensure that both boat and crew are in a safe and sensible condition to race. In this event, that's especially important. What is it that makes it a classic, then? Um, well, it's a long way. It's 202 miles, and it is a true offshore race. We go right out into the ocean. One leg's 97 miles. So uh, it's rough out there. It really does test the equipment and the men. How much of a test is it, then? Well, it's the ultimate. You can't ask for anything worse than what they can give you here. Just as one wouldn't expect to find a Formula One Grand Prix car on the road, a racing powerboat only goes into the water at the last possible moment. The Via Regians had plenty to cheer. Two locally built boats, plus a former national champion with a real chance of winning. In an atmosphere of chaotic festivity, the Italians had a field day. Casillas' catamaran wasn't going. He was in hospital after falling off his yacht the night before. Some boats were being withdrawn. The problem was the weather, fine and sunny on shore, but extremely rough out at sea. For a time, it was doubtful whether the race would be run at all. But after a dispute which threatened an international incident, it was decided to go ahead. Only half the assembled fleet made its way out of the harbour to the start line. This was no time for the faint-hearted. The boats themselves would stand the strain at 80 miles an hour if conditions would permit, but with the engines and the crew. The biggest threat to the shed boats was Mike Doxford's Limit Up, already heading for the European Championship. And there was another of the rival American cigarette boats, Iraf, driven by Italy's Guilo De Angelis. The ultimate test, they said, and this was it.
One of Shedd's boats, Alitalia Due, was an early casualty, leaving three main contenders. difficult to actually describe what being in a powerboat race is like, but everybody who comes out in a powerboat for the first time cannot believe that anybody can put up with the thumping, crashing, banging about which the things do, in that the boat is basically a pretty unstable thing. The only thing which in fact is keeping it upright at high speed is the driver. run-in is always the worst. When as soon as you pass the halfway mark, you then have to sit back and just think, is all the machinery going to hold together? Will something go? Will we run out of fuel? Will we get terrible problems with hitting a piece of driftwood, hit a lobster pot? Are we in fact going to finish? Mike Doxford, the aspiring European champion, blew an engine, and that left only two in it. The result for the Italians couldn't have been better. De Angelis won, having taken his own course and kept out of sight. The only other finisher would be a boat the Via Regians had built, designed and crewed by Shed. De Angelis, or no? For the two that had completed one of the toughest tests ever for power boats, a hero's welcome. Shed's boat had taken a pounding, and so had he. No one knew it, not even him, but he'd broken a leg, and all he could think about was improving the design. Do you think it was right to hold the race in those sort of conditions? Yes, I do. Oh, I do. I'm absolutely very keen on races being held in rough water. It does us all a lot of good particularly does a lot for the design of the boats in that if they are just going to be run on mirror waters why race on the sea you could do that on a lake the sea is it what sort of lessons do you think you learned from today as you say one of the roughest races you've ever had it's one of the right we've we did we've learned quite a bit about our cockpit again which one wouldn't think that after 10 years of making race boat cockpits and getting them carried a simple thing like that can 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 go and make us very uncomfortable we have to make those stronger again just a typical lesson of racing. I love very much Shed because uh, he has the three qualities. He loves sea, designs well, and he's a rough man. I think his contribution has been immense. I mean, he's been lucky in so much as he's had the odd owner that's prepared to try something new. And uh, he's, a, he's a hard competitor. He's a very good competitor. And I think he's added a tremendous amount to the sport. We need a lot more people like him in it. <laughs>